Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Marseillaise. The Marseillaise was written in the late 18th century in days of the French Revolution. Over time, the song became a symbol of revolution in general as it personified the energy of revolutionary movements. In Russia, back in the 20th century, where a 300-year monarchy had been overthrown in February 1917, the armored trains were moving and shelling not to the sounds of the Marseillaise, but seemingly to bless their revolution as well and the hopes of millions of people. A contemporary recalled that these were heady days when it seemed as if life had erupted into a tornado, whirlwind catching people, events and regimes alike. The Ukrainian revolution prevailed upon the European governments of the time to see Ukraine as a single nation, but it didn't create a single model for the country. All the Ukrainian governments of the time, in quick succession, beginning with the Central Rada, the Hetmanate under Pavlos Korpatsky, the Directoria presided over by Simon Petlura, all saw the future differently. Neither of these political forces were able to claim victory. What ended up is well known, the Bolsheviks won. The Ukrainian project, however, didn't stop after the Bolshevik victory. Instead, it was nurtured by another political force which is hardly mentioned nowadays. His name was Oleksandr Shumsky, a unique personality. He was the founder and leader of the Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party. After its split, he established and led the Board Beast Party and eventually ended up in the inner circle of Bolshevik leaders. In October 1924, soon after his return from a diplomatic mission to Poland, Oleksandr Shumsky was appointed as People's Commissar for Education in Ukraine. The former leader of the Borbis party immediately applied himself to implementing the policies of indigenization and Ukrainization. By criticizing the demagoguery and insincerity of such proponents of Ukrainization, Ukrainizators as the Stalin-aligned official in Ukraine, Lazar Kahanovich, Shumsky and his supporters condemned themselves to a new nightmare. They were accused of national deviationism. In early 1927, Oleksandr Shumsky was dismissed from the position of Commissar of Education and was summoned to Moscow. He would soon find himself in Leningrad. Shumsky claimed that his dismissal was due to the temporary dominance of pro-Russian forces in Ukraine. Even so, Shumsky remained optimistic and tried to convince his friends that in a year or two they will see what a mess they created by becoming detached from the Ukrainian reality. Shumsky kept hoping that he would be granted the possibility of resuming a responsible political position. On May the 13, 1933, the same day when Mykola Khvilovy took his own life in Kharkiv, Shumsky was arrested in the Tolmachovo train station in the Leningrad region. I was among of the first to work on the case of Oleksandr Shumsky. Ridiculous accusations were made against him of being a member of the so-called Ukrainian military organization. It was from the moment that Oleksandr Shumsky understood that he had to fight for his rehabilitation by himself. And so it was for the next 13 years. This was the murder scene. The Sandarmoch forest near the city of Medjezhigorsk in Karelia. Here, in the autumn of 1937, 111 prisoners in the Solovki camp were killed and secretly buried. Among them were numerous colleagues of Oleksandr Shumsky, 
including Les Kurbas, Mykola Kulish, Mihailo Yalovi, and the former board beast Mihailo Polos and Petro Solodub. Shunsky's grave is not here, although he could have suffered the same fate as his compatriots. In course of the so-called 1933-1934 criminal investigation, Shumsky's previously like-minded colleagues testified against him. His deputy at the Commissariat for Education, Petro Solodub, the head of Ukrainian science and member of the Commissariat board, Yuri Ozersky, art historian Mykola Hristovy, the deputy chief of the political education committee, Mihailo Volubuy, members of the Communist Party of Western Ukraine, Karlo Maksimovich, Roman Turiansky, and others. Unlike them, Shumsky didn't sign any false protocols. Moreover, and notwithstanding the inhuman treatment to which he was subjected, from the first days of his arrest, he attacked his investigators, stating that all allegations against him were ludicrous and false. Listen to the tone in which he conversed with the investigators. In contrast to what you allege, I wasn't engaged in any counter-revolutionary activities. I refused to discuss any alignment with counter-revolutionary organizations. Please, ask specific questions, and I will give you specific, laconic answers. By edict of the Collegium of Joint State Political Directorate, OGPU, Shumsky was sentenced to 10 years of corrective labor camps. He was sent to the Solovki and found himself in Division 8 of the White Sea Baltic Factory. The factory's administration was based here in Medvezhegorsk, Karelia. Later on, Semen Pidhaini and Mihailo Polos testified that they saw him in the transit camp in Kem. I met him in 1933, not on the Solovki per se, but in, I would say, the entrance hall to the Solovki on Popov Island near the port of Moore's Blast. This is how Semen Pidhaini described his encounter with Shumsky. These are the remains of the harbor near Kem on the White Sea. Here used to be the starting point for sending convicts to the Solovki. And over there is Popov Island. Once endless stone slabs without a single tree enclosed with the barbed along the shoreline and a high fence on ground. This was the camp transit camp. Shumsky stayed here until the beginning of spring navigation in 1934. Though, even after spring ice breakup, he set off not for the Solovki, but to Moscow. The investigations continued in Moscow, Kharkiv and Kyiv. An excerpt from Shumsky's telegram to the OGPU. I am bound to seek rehabilitation even at the cost of my own life. Shumsky's protest disclosures of falsification by investigators, persistent claims for public rehabilitation, brought incredible results. He escaped from the Solovki, the place of suffering and despair. 
On December the 10th, 1935, by decree of the Special Council of the USSR, NKVD, his case was reviewed. He was now sentenced to 10 years of exile in Krasnoyarsk and a further struggle for his life and reputation. My name has been disgraced in the public mind. I urge the session of the Supreme Council to rehabilitate me. Oleksandr Shumsky could have been destroyed immediately after the arrest, but owing to his struggle for rehabilitation, he didn't allow it to happen so easily. The system, however, would eventually catch and eliminate him, as if in a chase. Now this story can be told. On September the 5th, 1943, Shumsky's term of exile expired. In the press and political meetings, he was branded as a pillar of the so-called Shumskis and accused with all kind of stupidities. But he was now formally a free man and could go wherever he wanted. True, Shumsky was formally free. Suddenly, in April 1945, a letter appears. In a letter to Lazar Kahanovich, Shumsky wrote, my situation is hopeless. After fruitless efforts to find a way out, I have decided to turn to you. A letter to Lazar Kahanovich, to Shumsky's main antagonist, to the person who would seal his fate. But we need to understand that this was a letter not from Shumsky the Borbis, but Shumsky the invalid. His legs were now paralyzed. For six years he had been confined to bed and dependent on those without whose help he would not have survived. So his freedom was the freedom of being confined to a hospital and then to a nursing home without any means of livelihood and shelter. And he had no documents. Shumsky's letter to Lavrenti Beria said, May 1945. I found myself in a situation of a person without documents and rights. I ask you to help me out by refuting the slander against my name that was never proven despite a six-year investigation. There will be no rehabilitation and no documents. The circle is closed. I object to this boycott of my requests and appeals, as well as to the secrecy in which I was suffering in punishment. I object to the punishment against me, the punishment without daylight, without the light of publicity, and without the possibility of self-defense. I object to the regime of discrimination. I am not afraid of any charges. Public discreditation will disappear through public rehabilitation. This was written in August 1945. And do you know to whom this was addressed to? The father of nations, the father of victory, to Stalin, whose call by that time had reached its climax. And Shumsky writes him, I object. The decision to commit suicide, wrote Shumsky, is the strongest form of protest and was made after all means of struggle for rehabilitation had been exhausted. I made this decision back in autumn of 1945, but I didn't want to die in Siberia. I utterly detest the place. I decided to die in my homeland. Human life resembles a journey by train. There is a departure station and an arrival station. This is the way it was with Shumsky. At Tolmachova railway station near Leningrad, he was arrested. At Kersanov station in the backwater of Russia, his trail gets called. This was his departure station, and it was previously known not as Novoborova, but Turchinka. And here a miracle happened. 
Shumsky was handed a passport and permitted to return to Ukraine. Yes, indeed. He was allowed to return to his homeland. And this came as a great surprise. Perhaps it occurred because of his public threats to commit suicide. But there is another reason. Shumsky wasn't traveling alone. All the way he was being escorted by a hospital worker. For a long time, it was believed that Shumsky committed suicide en route to Ukraine. However, according to previously inaccessible documents, it was, in fact, quite different. Today we release to the public the documents that have been out of reach for over 60 years, almost 70 years. They refer to the case of Oleksandr Shumsky, to the late period of Shumsky's life, to the period of his exile to Krasnoyarsk Krai, and then his transfer to Saratov, to the time of his death. On the 15th of June 1946, escorted by a medic, Shumsky arrived in Saratov. He moved into an apartment where his wife and son had previously lived. For him, this brought back memories of his closest friends and family, a remembrance and farewell to them. On June the 18th, 1946, the MGB staff found a package in the apartment where Shumsky attempted to commit suicide. The package was assembled by Oleksandr Shumsky himself. Upon arrival at the site, Comrade Shumsky was found in apartment number 5, lying in bed with the right hand vein above his elbow, cut open with a razor. As a result, there was a lot of blood spilled onto the bed. Shumsky remained conscious. The reason for suicide will become apparent from the contents of the package. Shumsky. July the 16th, 1946. Shumsky was taken to hospital, but the package's contents showed that he had a passport and could travel to Ukraine. Why then the suicide attempt? Driving a shiny wedge into the heart will put an end to my advertisements and deprive me of the triple burden of discrimination, loneliness and sickness. This was written on July the 17th. The next day Shumsky would write, Terrible. I did it all wrong. The wedge stuck between my ribs and didn't reach the heart. My head fared better, but lacked sufficient strength. Must try a different way today. So, in a single day, on July the 18th, Shumsky tried two suicide attempts, both unsuccessful. Finally, I am home. Silence, emptiness, rage. This is all what I was striving for. If I had been strong enough to build a boat, where would I sail it? On the sea of life. Even more so, as this place is covered with thick dust. I have neither a goal nor dreams. So let winds blow. Their hope will be for me like a song. Shumsky.
Євдокія Олексіївна Гончаренко. Євдокія Гончаренко, Шумський звай. In April 1935, she was sent into exile to Saratov. She stayed faithful to her husband, and he was constantly thinking of her as well. He recalled her visiting him in this Solovki, sending him warm clothes, money, and letters. He remembered that the NKVD had asked her to come to Krasnoyarsk in January 1936. At that time, he had been on a hunger strike for almost a month in protest against his exile. She took part in an investigation as to whether Shumsky was indeed on a hunger strike. She wrote protest demanding hospitalization for him. She intended to go to Moscow. She saved his life that time. Then she fell silent. He didn't know what had happened to her. He didn't know for certain sure, but he had premonitions of the worst. Shumsky's anticipations, unfortunately, were accurate. The dossier on Yevdokia Honcharenko reveals that she worked in a state publisher's book warehouse. She was spied upon on suspicion of links with socialist revolutionaries. She was eliminated in 1937 because of words, a phrase. This is the only book which truthfully describes children of the intelligentsia. This is how Honcharenko described a novel by Valentin Kataev, A White Sail Glimpse. So, if this was the only truthful novel, what were all the other works there? Yevdokia Honcharenko was accused of slander against Soviet literature. She was shot and executed. Shumsky last saw his son Yaroslav in 1933. In 1937, the boy became an orphan. They would never meet again. Yaroslav Shumsky perished near Moscow in 1942. Life does indeed resemble a journey by train. There is a departure station and an arrival station. Where is Alexander Shumsky's arrival station? Is it in Kersanov, at a railway station in Penza region, Russia, where, according to official records, he died suddenly? Where is his grave? Or is it maybe in Saratov, where he was bloodily killed? Top secret. Transmission via HF, device number 2446, Moscow. Attention of Chief of A Department at MGB of USSR, Major General Herzovsky. In October 1945, we obtained a letter addressed from Shumsky to Comrade Stalin at an outright anti-Soviet nationalistic character. There was a plan, the copy still exists, and is stored in the archives. This was an action plan approved by Avakumov on September the 8th on the case titled Ferret, in quotation marks. This is how they call the Shumsky conspiracy case. This murder had to take place in Magpi, an encoded name for the city of Saratov, or a special measure, as they sometimes put it. A special team was sent, led by Andreev, who went under the pseudonym Sudoplatov. Personal motives were later altered to show strictly political ones, a protest against a new course of national policy, the course of Russian great power policy. What impressed me the most when I saw these papers in the archive was that there was no final report on the execution of the plan. Instead, there was a strange detail not typically found in the archives. There was an unfolded Kazbek cigarette pack on which the train schedules from Moscow to Saratov were written inside. There was also a sketch of the inside of the rail car, the compartment, the toilet and the crew compartment. It is highly likely, I can only assume, as this wasn't in the plan, that these very details of how the murder would be committed were already conceived in Saratov. Your statement prizing the Russian nation and the Dividing the Union of Nations according to mindset, character, etc., has raised alarm. In his lyrical Little Russian ecstasy style, Nikita Khrushchev holds with the Ukrainian nation's gratitude to the Russian one. But for what? Apparently for the clear mind, stiff character, and strong will of the Russian nation. 
So what does that say about the Ukrainian nation on behalf of whom such words were stated? What does such a letter remind Stalin of? Of the shift in political course of how, in Shumsky's opinion, a communist, the senior Kremlin, Areopagos, was turning into a bully representing the state, into an imperialist, in fact. Though the letter itself was tempered in language, it was full of revolutionary communist pathos, the right to self-determination, respect and equality of nations. That letter couldn't but make Stalin angry as a challenged the state's entire political establishment, claiming that there was the Russian nation and minor fraternal nations and so forth. Why don't you like the label Little Russians? What's wrong with it? Asked Grigory Petrovsky, the head of Ukraine's executive committee, asked Shumsky. Why don't I like the traitors, opportunistic nature of little Russians, replied Shumsky, because they were slavish, two-faced, and traitors in all historical epochs. At the moment, they call themselves communists and cry out for internationalism. But their little Russian nature remains all the same. Time passed. And Petrovsky unexpectedly reminded Shumsky of their old conversation. Be sure that the party will never forgive you for the little Russian's comment. You'll pay for that. Mark my words. Pavlo Sudoplatov recalled, Myronovsky then carried the head of the MGB toxicology lab, was urgently summoned to Saratov, where Shumsky stayed in hospital. On September the 18th, 1946, Shumsky left for Ukraine. However, he was not destined to reach it. As the official death certificate reads, Oleksandr Shumsky died at the train station in Kherson of sudden death. Sudoplatov's combat team with Sudoplatov in the lead entered the train compartment, covered his mouth, held him by the hands, and Myronovsky, the notorious doctor murderer, gave him a lethal injection. It was to Saratov that the then current deputy minister for state security of the USSR, Sergei Ogoltsov, arrived to organize the special operation. This was Saratov, where Lazar Kahanovich arrived as well. Arrived for what? Was it to be sure that the so-called Shumskism was exterminated 20 years after its campaign had unfurled? Or was it just to be sure that his old political opponent had finally been eliminated?